And we can get control over the difference between the product SNTN and the product of limits ST by using this clever add and subtract trick and then factoring out by grouping an SN from the first pair and a capital T from the second pair. What we end up with is something that looks like this, SN times the quantity TN minus T uh, plus T times the quantity SN minus S. And, and then what we realize is that we can split apart this absolute value in a couple of different ways. First of all, we can use the triangle inequality applied to this addition right here um, to break it apart over the plus. So let's do that. We end up here with less than the absolute value of Sn times the quantity Tn minus T. less than or equal to, I'm sorry, plus absolute value of uh, T times the quantity Sn minus S. And then we can use the norm property. And so our last step is to use the product property, the homogeneity property of absolute values, to split this part into four different pieces. This is equal to absolute value of Sn times the absolute value of Tn minus T plus the absolute value of S, uh, sorry, of T times the absolute value of Sn minus S. And just for the sake of us being able to refer to these four pieces separately, let me give them names. Let me call this first piece in here piece A. Let me call this piece B, C, and D. And so our job now to finish our scratch work is to figure out how we know that we can have control over all four of these pieces such that the ultimate result that we want, remember, is that we need to be able to show that this whole thing is somehow less than epsilon okay, when we have the control that we need over each of these four pieces. So we have four different pieces that we need to control in a way that the whole sum a times B plus C times D, that whole sum needs to be made less than epsilon. So let me go through and ask for each of these pieces, how do we know we can control it? Okay. So let's start with the last piece, piece D. How do I know that I can have control over the value of the absolute value of S sine minus S? Okay. Uh, it's given that the SN sequence is a convergent sequence. Namely, S, capital S, is its limit. And therefore, we have control over the distance between Sn and S. We can make that as small as we want to. Any number that we feed into the definition of convergence, we will get a capital N such that for all N greater than or equal to that capital N, this quantity is less than that distance that we choose. And the same thing is true for the Tn minus T quantity. We can make that quantity as small as we would like past a certain point, capital N, in that sequence. So the definition of convergence will give us control over this, it will give us control over that. Okay, so parts B and part D, those are taken care of. Part C is a constant, absolute value of T. It doesn't depend on little n. So we have kind of the ultimate control over this quantity. It's not going to run away from us as n goes to infinity, it's just a constant. So we don't have to worry about that part. So the one last piece that I am unsure in the beginning why we have control over is how do we know that we have control over the absolute value of Sn? In other words, not its distance from s, the limit, but its distance from 0. How do we know that that control exists? Because Sn is a convergent sequence, what do we also know about Sn? It's bounded. It's bounded, right. And so the way that we get control over piece A is using theorem 2.11. Theorem 2.11 says every convergent sequence is bounded. So Sn is convergent. That implies that Sn is bounded. So there, we're not using a definition. There, we're using the result of a theorem, which, of course, is why we like theorems in mathematics, right? Is that we can, we can then apply them to situations like this one. So part A, we can get control over by having uh, Theorem 2.11 tell us that Sn is bounded. In other words, for all natural numbers n, absolute value of Sn is less than or equal to some uniform upper bound, some real number m. <coughs>
So there exists an m real number such that for all n in the natural numbers, the absolute value of Sn is less than or equal to n. So that gets us a bound on the entire sequence Sn. For these two quantities, for quantities b and d, we're appealing to the definition of convergence. So that doesn't give us a bound on the entire sequence, but it does give us a bound on the tail of the sequence. So there exists an n1, and there exists an n2 natural number, such that for all n greater than or equal to n1, absolute value of tn minus t is less than whatever we would like to put here. Right? And for all n greater than or equal to n2, the absolute value of Sn minus S is less than whatever we would like to put here. So then our question is, what do we want to put here? How do we want to fill in those two blanks? How small would we like to make Sn minus S, and how small would we like to make Tn minus T? If we want this whole thing to add up to be less than epsilon. Well, one idea is we have two different terms here. Right? I've got A times B is one of my terms. C times D is my other term. Maybe I can take this epsilon and split it into two equal pieces. Make this first product, A times B, less than a half epsilon. And the second term, C times D, also less than a half epsilon. If we can do that, then we'll be all set. So if I'm going to do that, let's take a look at the, the first term here. We know that part A is bounded by capital M. So if I want this whole thing to be bounded by half of epsilon, then how big, how small, I should say, do I want to make B? I'm going to do some scratch work um, somewhere else on the board here. I'll end up erasing this, probably. But if I have absolute value of Sn, and I have absolute value of Tn minus T, and I know that this part is going to be less than or equal to M, and I want the whole thing, the whole product, to be less than epsilon over 2, then what bound do I want to put here? How should I bound Tn minus T? In fact, let's just do it this way. If I want to make that equal to epsilon over 2, then what goes here? I can just do the algebra. And find out that if I make the distance between Tn and T less than epsilon over 2m, then when I multiply that by m, I'm going to get epsilon over 2, which is how big I want their product to be for my proof. So that's how I'll fill in this first blank over here. That's how small we're going to want to make Tn minus T. We'll make Tn minus T less than, in absolute value, the distance between Tn and T. We'll make it less than epsilon over 2m. If I do that, then the product of Sn times Tn minus T, we can make less than epsilon, over 2, sorry, less than half epsilon. Then we're going to play the same game for the Sn minus S over here. So there I have a product. This time it's the product of absolute value of T and absolute value of Sn minus S. And I'd like to make that product also less than epsilon over 2 somehow. So then, how small do I need to make Sn minus S? We can do the algebra again. Yeah, epsilon over absolute value of t. And then I put a 2 down there also, because I want to make the whole thing smaller than a half epsilon. Um, so we could use epsilon over 2 absolute value of t. If you look at the proof in our author that our author writes in the book, um, the author does something a little bit interesting that maybe we can take just a quick moment to talk about. The author doesn't actually use epsilon over 2 absolute value of t for this bound, because why might that be problematic? t could be 0, right? If t were equal to 0, in other words, if our tn sequence had a limit of 0, which is certainly a thing that could happen, right, then we won't be able to divide by it. So how does the author get around that, those of you who looked at this proof? 
Yeah. The author, there's three authors, I suppose. I should be giving all three of them credit for this. Um, they add one in the denominator. That way, we're never going to be dividing by zero, because two absolute value of t is always going to be non-negative, and I add one to it, I'm going to get a positive quantity, so I'm never going to divide by zero anymore. And this still works, because now this is still going to be less than epsilon over 2. Because by adding a 1 in the denominator, we've now made this fraction even smaller than it was before. So if the original fraction was smaller than it was equal to epsilon over 2, this fraction is now smaller than epsilon over 2. And that's, after all, what we wanted. Right? Is we just wanted to make this whole thing smaller than epsilon over 2. So if you want to be really careful about this proof, um, we'll use epsilon over 2 absolute value of t plus 1 okay, for the bound in this part over here. So why don't I make that quick adjustment? And then we'll have all of our pieces uh, that we need to make this proof work. So less than epsilon over 2 absolute value of t plus 1. Our job now is to structure our proof using the definition of convergence, using the definition of the thing that we're trying to prove is true, namely that SNTN converges to ST. And so we'll use that definition, the four clauses of that definition, to suggest the structure for our proof. For all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a natural number, capital N, such that for all N greater than or equal to N, we're going to have absolute value of SNTN minus ST is less than epsilon. So those were our four clauses that we need in order to demonstrate SNTN converges to ST. Our universal quantifiers all turn into very familiar statements for our proof. Uh, the first one turns into let epsilon greater than zero be arbitrarily chosen. The second universal quantifier is down on this little n. So we'll turn that into the boilerplate statement also. Let n greater than or equal to n be arbitrarily chosen. And then the algebra that we need to justify this inequality is exactly the algebra that we did in our scratch work up here. So I'm actually just going to copy and paste that scratch work maybe without the A, B, C, and D down there. This is another nice thing about using an iPad instead of a whiteboard, is I can literally just drop this right in, copy and paste. So all of that work goes right there. And so our big gap here, actually, let's finish this algebra real quickly. Um, we need to be able to say that this is less than um, my bound for the SNs, which is M. My bound for the TN minus Ts, which is epsilon over 2M. Plus, my bound on the absolute values of T. Uh, actually, that is just absolute value of T. No bound necessary, because it's a constant. Times the bound on SN minus S. That was epsilon over 2 absolute value of T plus 1. And then when we do all of the arithmetic here, these m's cancel and give me an epsilon over 2. The t over 2 absolute value of t plus 1 is less than 1 half. And so this becomes less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2. And that's equal to epsilon, which completes the proof. So the only thing that we haven't answered in this proof is how are we choosing a single capital N that will allow us to make all of these estimates that we made in this last line of the proof. Where does our capital N come from? Any other questions or things you want to expand upon in this rather intricate, lot of moving parts proofs?